You hear me? Okay. Ready, Kerry? All right. All right. Good. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is not nice. Good evening. Uh, welcome to our uh, Carbon Air Municipal Plan and Development Regulation Review, 2024 to 20, 2034. I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. This is an opportunity for you guys to have a say in what you want to recommend the town of Carabineer to put into regulations going forward for the next 10 years. Over the past 10 years plus, uh, we did have our own regulations, but we modified them as the years went by. So now we're basically updating them so that uh, if something arises, we can just go ahead and stick to the regulations. This is it here. And if there's any deviation, of course, we will take it into consideration as well. So uh, basically, Ian will be the presentator tonight. And if you have any questions or, answer, or questions for Ian or the audience, come up to this microphone right here. And uh, at the end. At the end, yes. yes. Now, if you have a pressing question during the event, I guess you can just ask it out loud here if it's something that's not. Preferably at the end, but if you didn't hear something or something like that, right? But at the end of it, come up, yes. and, and this is the microphone and the, the venue that you're going to use for asking questions. And I'm sure everyone here will be cordial tonight, and uh, it, it is for the residents mostly, councillors as well, but, give, but councillors already had their opportunity to uh, have their input. The residents are what we're basically here for tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ian Watson, and thank you, sir. <laughs> and Keep it to yourself. All right. I'll just wait for that door to close and then. All right. All good. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, everyone. And I know some of you have a show to get to, so uh, we'll get right into it. Um, this is a public meeting for the uh, Municipal Plan and Development Regulations Review. My name is Ian Watson, and I'm a senior planner with Upland. We're working with the town uh, on this project. Uh, I'm not going to give the full background on planning. Tonight's to hear about the draft, but I do really quickly uh, want to touch on what these documents are. Uh, so in Newfoundland and Labrador, we have the Urban and Rural Planning Act. It's our toolbox as, as towns and municipalities for uh, the things that we can uh, do when it comes to planning. And out of that toolbox, we kind of drop a blueprint for our community, which is the municipal plan. It's a high level document with policies and visions and kind of setting out uh, how we want the community to grow over the next 10 years. And we take those policies and we turn them into development regulations and those are the actual rules for you know it's the zoning it's where you can build a house or open a business and what the standards are for those different things um, and it's what the town uses when you come to get a permit to build or to subdivide or whatever it may be uh, that's what the town looks at uh, when uh, determining uh, whether you get a you know whether you can have a permit or not and so you know through these documents we shape basically the the community that we want to be physically and a key thing is that the regulations have to agree with the plan and the plan has to be consistent with the act so uh, as I kind of alluded to the goal of this project is to update that blueprint and those regulations uh, for the town and why now uh, well one of the I mean I mean I guess one of the key reasons is that uh, that toolbox, that act, requires uh, us to review our plans every 10 years. A good plan doesn't sit still. It doesn't, it's not set in stone. You come back to it and you update it um, because the assumptions, the conditions, uh, when you initially wrote a plan, they change. Uh, who, you know, who would have thought the last four years, you know, when they're writing the, the current plan, who would have, you know, thought about the last four years and what the effects on, like, work from home and all of those kinds of things. Uh, climate change has become more pressing, housing issues. Um, so just like a business plan, you come back to your town plans, your municipal plans, and you update them to make sure that they're current and that they uh, reflect the needs of today. 
and you know as much as we are do kind of a big review every 10 years as the mayor mentioned um there's also small changes that come over the life of a plan we you know i'm not perfect we we don't get everything right uh or there's things that we didn't know about when we write a plan so um, people come in on the regular and they ask for rezonings or for amendments to the plan um, to make changes to accommodate their needs uh, or things that were missed and then council considers those changes uh, you know for that specific thing and there's a public process for that and uh, so changes can happen in between those 10 years So in terms of this project, I guess we've kind of been at it since the end of 2022, uh, getting our feet under us, a lot of internal work, um, background research, understanding the community. Uh, and then in the spring of, I guess it was this time uh, in last year, we were here and I recognized many familiar faces uh, in the room. Uh, we did kind of an initial round of engagement asking the big questions, what matters to you, what are key issues that we need to address through this plan review. Um, there was at the time a survey and uh, a public meeting much like this and drop-in meetings, stakeholder engagement. Uh, so we had, heard a lot of really good uh, feedback as part of that process, a lot of really good ideas. We summarized that um, and took it to council for some kind of high level direction on what do we want to do with this plan to reflect all that engagement that we heard. Um, then kind of in the fall and into the winter, we were drafting the documents to, to reflect uh, that engagement. Um, then working with staff internally to refine them to make sure that they worked for, you know, the people who have to enforce these documents, who have to issue permits. Um, then working with council to make sure they were, they were okay, with, at least in concept with the high level direction for, for engagement purposes. Uh, and then now here to hear your feedback on what did we get right? What did we miss? Uh, what could be tweaked? And so we're kind of in this uh, first key draft engagement stage. Uh, so we have the meeting tonight. We'll be taking questions and answers and comments tonight. Um, but also we have uh, drop-in <laughs> sessions. I'll be over in the community room tomorrow uh, from 9 till 12-ish. And I'll duck out for lunch and then from 1 till 4. So. Uh, you can drop in at any time. Um, if you want a specific time, come talk to me after this meeting. Um, but drop in any time then if you, you know, have more detailed questions you want to ask, if you have a specific property uh, you want to get into, you know, you know how's this plan going to affect that property or here's my ideas for it. Um, That's a great opportunity to come and <laughs> chat with me. And then uh, this draft feedback period uh, will be open until April 21st. And so there is uh, tomorrow's drop-in sessions are one way to provide feedback, uh, but the other is uh, there is a um, project website, carboneerplan.ca, um, and there's an email address there. You can send emails. Or actually, what would be really great is there's an online form that you can put feedback there on the drafts. Um, that makes sure that makes sure it's all captured in one place. Um, if you're not a digital person, uh, by all means, drop something off to the town, you know, written feedback, and they'll make sure it get, makes its way to us. Uh, once we have all that feedback, we'll put it together in a summary report, we'll summarize everything we've heard, uh, and we'll put out options for council on, you know, here's, here's what people were saying that they liked or didn't like, uh, how do you want to respond to this? Uh, we'll bring those options to council for direction uh, sometime in the kind of mid-spring. We will update the drafts uh, d in the ways that council directs, and then they go off to the province for review. It's kind of a bit of a black box. Uh, I don't know how long that will take. Um, we'll get the review back eventually, um, make edits, and then uh, council is in a position to go into the formal adoption process. And as part of that process, there's another round of engagement. There's a public hearing. Um, it's, it's a little more formal. You make your submissions or you uh, come and stand up and speak to a commissioner who records all that and puts together a report to council and recommendations to council uh, before council uh, adopts the documents. So everything we heard in the initial engagement um, is summarized in a what we heard report uh, from last summer and that's available still on the project website carboneerplan.ca 
And some of the key themes uh, that we heard as part of that engagement were uh, housing, uh, you know, affordable, available, appropriate housing, um, supporting economic development, especially as it relates to retaining youth, responding to climate change, sea level rise, um, community character, especially the heritage assets, Water Street, um, expanding transportation options. Uh, we heard a lot about active transportation, especially like walking and cycling. Um, we heard about urban agriculture and uh, livestock, and also um, the value that people place on recreational spaces and making sure we're doing what we can to enhance those. So we took all those key themes and um, developed drafts of the municipal plan and development regulations. And I should say that these documents, you know, these aren't entirely from scratch. You have an existing municipal plan, I mean, existing uh, development regulations. If you've done any sort of development or, or renovations or whatever, you've likely interacted with them in some way. Um, you know, these are a review and evolution of those documents, and so they're not entirely from scratch. Uh, and tonight, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on the changes because uh, if I went through the whole documents, uh, we'd be here till till tomorrow morning. Um, but you know that does assume a little bit of knowledge of what is now. Uh, so if there are questions about you know what does that mean, uh, or uh, happy to take them and happy to answer those. So uh, first of all, the municipal plan uh, includes a new vision that the town of Carbonier is a vibrant, welcoming, inclusive, and connected community. As a service center for communities on the western side of Conception Bay, Carbonier continues to provide an abundance of business opportunities, health services, educational facilities, and recreation opportunities. Thoughtful planning and sustainable investments in infrastructure provide a welcoming environment for housing development that me meets the needs of all residents. Carbonier's culture, built heritage, and long history are cherished, while at the same time recognizing that welcoming a diversity of cultures and perspectives creates strength and opportunity in an increasingly globalized world. The town and its residents build, build on a long history of resilience to prepare for, adapt to, and thrive in the face of modern challenges, including climate change and economic shifts. So I think uh, hopefully that captures uh, those key engagement themes and then flows through into uh, the changes that we've proposed to the documents. So the first uh, of those is housing. Um, we heard a lot about housing and making sure there was opportunities uh, for housing in the town, especially housing that's uh, affordable, attainable, uh, and appropriate uh, you know, to different stages of life. Uh, people have different housing needs as they go through different stages of life and making sure that there are options in the community so that people uh, can stay here and, and, and find housing that meets their needs. So some of the key changes uh, to, the, to the documents to uh, help improve housing options. Uh, one is the creation of a new uh, zone, a higher density uh, residential zone. So um, most of Carbonier zoned residential medium density. This new higher density zone uh, would allow um, up to 20 dwelling units on a lot. Um, and we've gone through and pre-zoned some lands uh, with the zone to make it easy to do uh, residential development on those lands and, and I have a map later in the presentation that uh, highlights zoning changes. Another key change, a couple of other key changes actually uh, in the drafts are enabling accessory dwellings. So this would be, uh, so you might call them secondary suites or backyard suites or carriage houses, granny flats, whatever you want to call them. It's a second small dwelling on a lot, either in a de detached building or you know, attached to the main house, um, that, uh, you know, provides an opportunity to, for housing for family members or to rent out. Um, the accessory dwellings would be permitted up to 81 square meters. That's about 840 square feet, I think, uh, floor area. Uh, and then to go larger than that, it's a discretionary process where you come to uh, council and there's a public engagement um, before council makes a decision if you wanted to go larger than that. So that's uh, enabled uh, or proposed to be enabled as part of the drafts. Another key change is uh, removing lot size per unit lot size requirements for multi-unit dwellings, so apartment buildings uh, in the old 
in the existing bylaw or regulations, you have to have a certain amount of lot size for every unit that you want. So as your building gets bigger, the lot has to get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, which kind of eliminates some of the advantages of, of, of having uh, apartment buildings. So the drafts uh, remove that per unit lot size requirement. Um, and then also the residential medium density zone uh, permitting multi-units up to three units instead of two. And then finally, the commercial general zone, which applies to a lot of the commercial areas uh, except for Water Street, um, allowing residential in that zone on the upper floor. So maintaining that, that commercial nature of the zone, uh, commercial on the ground floor, but then you could have residential above if you wanted to go that route. Um, we also made changes as they relate to uh, businesses and, and economic development. Uh, so a, a one is kind of a small one, but important is clearly exempting small commercial teaching and home offices from the regulations. So this is, you know, we've seen a we've seen a growth in in in, in home offices, uh, and also you have things like piano teaching, that kind of stuff that you might do at home. Um, it's always been a gray area and whether that fell under the regulations or not, so it's not really a change so much as it's a clarification, clearly stating, yeah, no, you can do this, you don't need a permit, um, no one's going to come, come knocking sort of thing. Uh, we've also reduced the number of discretionary uses and moved them to permitted, so again, some, some things in the regulations you can just do if you meet the regulations and others you have to go through that discretionary process where you come to council and where there's a public process uh, and that can be useful if there's you know if there's real community concerns um, and so if we've kept it for many things but sometimes it can be a barrier to to um, getting things done um, so the uh, we've we've moved some of those lower impact discretionary uses to just being permitted um, the drafts also enable home occupations, so that'd be like a small home-based business, maybe it's um, cutting hair in your home or a small workshop. Um, there's an ability now through these drafts, or the, the proposed through these drafts, to have a small home business. Uh, and then there's a couple new uses being recognized uh, that weren't uh, necessarily identified in the current regulations, and you might have it might be more challenging to open them because you'd have to negotiate with the town about what they actually are. Now the drafts clearly recognize marine industry uses, uh, pet grooming, and craft beverage production. So that'd be like a microbrewery or something. We've also uh, reduced parking requirements. Um, parking's important. Uh, you got to have it uh, often to, to make sure you can have customers. But we also, if we require too much of it, that's a real burden on businesses. You're it takes land, it takes cost to construct, and if you don't actually need it, um, that's just an extra cost and, and takes up space in the community. So we've taken a hard look at the parking requirements and reduced them in some cases. Um, and then there's also uh, now ability to reduce them further. For example, um, if you provide, we heard a lot about active transportation, cycling, so uh, if you pro provide uh, bicycle parking, you can cut down on a bit of the car parking spaces you need, for example. Um, environment and climate, um, climate change and particularly in, in coastal communities, sea level rise uh, is, a, is a concern. Um, you know, when we were here last spring, seeing areas that were eroding um, that had you know, lost a lot of land over the past couple of years. So there's two kind of key things for that, uh, having minimum elevation for d development around, along the coast. So, uh, building it high enough that uh, it's not going to uh, deal with storm surges. And then also uh, having a, a, a horizontal distance set back from the coast for erosion purposes. And recognizing that not every coastline is eroding very much, we don't have good data on that, we, it's the, the setback is further and then there's an ability to build closer with kind of site specific uh, analysis. You can you know, look at the geology of the site if you have a site that's not eroding, then there's an ability to reduce it. Um, one of the key changes over the last couple of years has been electrical vehicles and uh, the need to charge them. These drafts recognize EVs as a use, uh, they're clearly permitted. And then also as part of those parking provisions for some of the larger uh, type uses, multi-unit dwellings, 
accommodations, uh, indoor assembly, shopping centers, for example, uh, requiring that a certain low low percentage, but a percentage nonetheless, uh, of the parking spaces have e EV chargers. And that would be for new going forward. It's, this isn't, I should say that for all of this. It's all going forward. These documents and, and that toolbox, that planning toolbox that we have, recognizes that people who built legally under previous rules did so in good faith and they're you know we don't go back and force these rules on uh, things that existed previously this is for new stuff uh, clearly recognizing solar collectors so uh, clearly permitting those um, both you know small on building ones or as a standalone use like if you're feeding into the grid uh, there's an ability to do that in the commercial general rural and mineral working zones same with mid-sized wind turbines. You know, Carboneer's a town and, and there's not a lot of land space in town, but there are rural areas in its planning area outside the town boundary um, that could accommodate uh, such things. So there's, a, there's an ability to consider that in these drafts. Um, the existing development regulations have flood rules uh, for the floodway and floodway fringe, but they weren't mapped and so they were hard to um, identify if you're just looking at the documents. So we've mapped those. And then just a small thing is enabling conservation uses, um, trails, land conservation, that kind of thing in all zones. From a uh, character and heritage point of view, um, we've put clear guidance in the documents for archaeological finds. This is actually a provincial requirement. You know, you're required to report archaeological finds, um, but we wanted to make that link clear, and so that's in the documents. Um, the heritage area zone has been a, was a big um, focus. So this zone covers; it's mostly on Water Street, though it goes up uh, some of the side streets coming up, uh, coming off Water Street, and it recognizes that historic, you know, downtown area, the Main Street area. Um, so the drafts don't permit dwellings on the ground floor west of Bond Street. So in that core actual commercial space, the zone actually goes past that, um, but in that core commercial space, keeping that commercial feel. And then having really basic design standards, nothing uh, heavy-handed, basic things on uh, exterior, uh, certain exterior materials, window uh, orientation. Um, and again, this is for new going forward, uh, just to ensure that any uh, new development in that area is generally supportive of the character of the area. Um, Accessory buildings is something uh, we had a lot of talk about with council. Uh, this is your sheds, your, your uh, greenhouses, all those things. Um, we've, it, there used to be a blanket uh, cap of 7%? Yeah, 7% lot area for, for um, uh, accessory buildings. And uh, now we do that by zone. Um, so. Uh, some zones have more, and in general, we've increased it a little bit. You know, people were building or wanting to build, for example, greenhouses over the over the pandemic, and were running into challenges where they couldn't fit them on their lot. And so there's uh, that that's been increased a little bit to uh, allow that to to uh, to happen. Um, and then just to encourage people to have registered heritage properties and recognizing that you know there can be challenges with that. There are some flexibilities in the rules for heritage properties, not having to provide parking. We don't want people to tear down a heritage building to fit the parking they need. Um, not having to, uh, there's some increases in things like how many, um, I think bed and breakfast rooms and the sort, of, sort of things that you could get a little bit of benefit for having registered heritage property. Uh, transportation and infrastructure, as I mentioned, the bicycle parking incentives, you can reduce um, your car parking if you, if you provide bike parking. Um, there's some policies about servicing extensions. So, uh, you may, so the town has its own boundary, but the area that the town plans actually goes beyond the town boundary. Um, so uh, there is a policy, or we, there's, the drafts have a policy that um, if services, sewer and water, are to be extended past the town boundary, that that would actually require those lands to be brought into the town. Uh, there's also policy around private roads and where those are appropriate. Um, and one of the challenges with private roads is 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 if they uh, 
you know, if there's a if there's a desire to have the town take them over, um, that those need to be brought up to a town standard so that the town uh, is is maintaining them the same as other roads uh, that the town owns. Um, these are kind of specific. Urban agriculture. Uh, we heard a lot about urban agriculture, and as I mentioned, for example, greenhouses were really big during the pandemic. I know I really got into gardening um, when I was at home. Uh, so one of the things we've done is uh, clearly recognized community gardens and permitted them in, in a lot of zones so that uh, if you wanted to start one of those up, it, there'd be no barriers from the town side. Um, another big discussion was accessory livestock, or livestock in, in small-scale livestock, so keeping, couple, uh, keeping some chickens at home or, or goats or sheep. Um, you know, there's a real desire for that. There's also a you know, need to balance that against uh, the impacts on the wider community. <laughs> So what we've landed on in the drafts is uh, having provisions for accessory livestock housing buildings. So, because we don't, through these regulations, really control animals so much as we control buildings and all of those things. So these are the rules for the buildings that hold animals. It's a bit of a getting at things sideways. Um, but there's rules in the drafts for accessory livestock housing buildings. Uh, so these would be your mini barns or your coops or whatever, uh, the, the rules state, you, the draft state that you'd have to meet zone setbacks for the main building, so you'd have to be set back from property lines, um, you know, to reduce the impact on your neighbor, um, and otherwise meet the zone standards for accessory buildings, so height's a little smaller, you know, it's keeping that scale appropriate. And that uh, on smaller lots, the building would be designed to only provide housing for up to 20 small animals, so that's your chickens and your rabbits, uh, and two medium animals, that's your goats and sheep and that kind of thing. If you have a larger lot, uh, like larger than about an acre, uh, there's an ability there to have a larger animal, for example, a horse or a cow. And I should note that this is specifically for urban agriculture. You know, if you're in the rural zone, uh, out in the unserviced areas of the town or beyond the town's boundary, um, there's separate provisions. We haven't changed them uh, for like kind of actual commercial commercial um, agriculture. Uh, so your your full on farms uh, that, that wouldn't be affected by this. Uh, recreation from a regulatory perspective. Um, you know, there, a lot of recreation comes down to programming and, and the priorities that the town puts in terms of uh, financial investment, but from a regulatory side, uh, one of the main ways that the town gets new uh, recreation lands is when there's a subdivision, there's a requirement that 10% uh, of that subdivision be given to the town as recreation lands. And sometimes what happens in communities is, you know, the, the leftover piece gets given as the recreation land, and it's not necessarily good for for a park or whatever. So um, we've put in the drafts guidance for usable land so that when the town is taking that recreation dedication, uh, that, the, uh, that we're sure that the land is good for recreation purposes. And then in general, um, we've cleaned up the documents, uh, hopefully made them easier to use. Uh, there were some inconsistencies in the existing documents that we cleaned up. Um, and you know, hopefully made it clear in, in terms of expectations for applications and all of that kind of stuff. The other thing um, that is that we've uh, put some basic provisions for fences in the regulations. The town has a separate fence bylaw or fence regulations, but we've put uh, some basic rules uh, in the uh, development regulations. And there's a bit of an inconsistency currently that these would allow slightly higher fences than the uh, fence regulations um, do currently, and, and council wanted to float that out as something that, uh, if that makes sense, then the fence regulations would be up, updated to, to align with that. And then the uh, development regulations, something that was missing was, uh, was provisions for swimming pools, residential swimming pools, uh, so making sure that those are fenced securely and safely. Um, is in there as well. Another big thing in the changes, it's hard to see up there, but um, is uh, on zoning. So we've actually 
you know, in, in doing this review, as I mentioned, we created a new zone, the, the residential multi-unit. Uh, and then also we took, to, took a look at properties. We took requests in the last round um, and also identified some proactively that we wanted to change. Um, so there are um, properties in orange where we've changed the zoning. Some of them were properties that were zoned for public buildings and are no longer used as public buildings. So we've put them in residential zoning. Um, some of them were rural zones, especially down here, uh, oh, this isn't, especially down uh, Crocker's Cove uh, that were rural, uh, unserviced, and through discussions with the town, uh, think it's reasonable uh, for services at the developer's cost uh, to be extended. So opening those, uh, rezoning those lands for, for resid residential development. Uh, this is west of town, the town boundaries and the dots there. So this, as, as you can see, the planning area actually s extends past the town boundary, but uh, this large area is the watershed uh, for the town's drinking water supply. We have updated uh, lines from the province of, of where that watershed actually is, so we've changed the boundaries of that um, and made a small tweak at Gunner's Pond uh, to bring some of the developed area was actually in the rural zone. We actually brought it into the seasonal residential zone. And finally, uh, more changes um, for lands that were uh, either rural or um, had been zoned commercially and never developed commercially, uh, or in this case, it's the old uh, fish plant, um, rezoning these lands for residential purposes to allow um, these lands uh, to ho hopefully provide housing uh, to the community in the future. So again, uh, that's kind of the high level changes. Um, if you have questions about what's in now or what these mean specifically, uh, happy to take those now uh, as well as comments. Um, if you have really detailed questions about, you know, how does this specifically affect my piece of land uh, or, or, or want to have a discussion about your piece of land or whatever, um, uh, happy to encourage you to come in tomorrow and, and happy to have a discussion. Um, or as I mentioned, uh, uh, written submissions to the town or online submissions at uh, carboneerplan.ca. If you have questions or comments, again, I'll remind you that it's being YouTube, so I encourage you to use the uh, microphone up there so that the sound is uh, recorded. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's just a couple of questions I have. Um, one is there's a large plot of land on the north side up this way here, and it's uh, zoned uh, um, conservation. Uh, is there anything in the town plan to uh, address that? I'd have to look at the specifics of it. Um, I don't think we've changed any lands that were zoned conservation. might have been zoned conservation and uh, if if there's not a strong reason or if that reason has changed uh, it's something that we could bring forward to council uh, for direction on on whether we should change it so one other issue I got now uh, uh, can uh, can uh, uh, commercial lots and uh, and uh, residential uh, mix yeah so that's um, in a couple places y yes and no so um, in the heritage area zone, uh, which is Water Street and the side streets, uh, that zone allows both commercial and residential. We've made a change, we've proposed a change to not have residential on the ground floor in the core core of the, of the heritage area. Um, in residential zones, um, th there's some of them have allowances for commercial uses discretionary, you know, so that council could consider uh, a request, for example, for a convenience store or something like that. Uh, in terms of bigger mixing, the big change we've done or we've proposed is in that commercial general zone, which applies out, you know, kind of to the big commercial area there, would be allowing residential on the upper floors. 
So still having that commercial ground floor, keeping the area its zone commercially, commercially, keeping it commercial, but having that residential uh, mixed in above. Okay. And uh, one other thing, uh, I'm going to talk chicken to you now. <laughs> uh, the farm regulations. Um, we have uh, we have certain uh, people here in the town who has been uh, uh, doing a bit of farming for a long, long while. And in, in as the plan states now, uh, there was no consideration, I don't think, given uh, to uh, grandfather and those people into it. Now, I'm referring to people who have been probably at it 40, maybe 50 years. And, uh, you know, like uh, coming under the regulations as they are there now, uh, they wouldn't be, uh, you know, like, I mean, they're going to be reduced back to what they're used to do. Now, when you look at the province's regulations and that and what they're trying to do as for, uh, I think they call it husbandry or whatever he wants to call it, uh, they're encouraging it. And they're encouraging it for the very reason it adds to the uh, food supply. So, you know, like when I, when I see something like that, you know, happening and, and those guys, as it exists there now, those guys will be uh, not able to do it anymore. So, I mean, uh, you know, like I'd like to see something in there that, you know, adds to that. And there's also something else I'd like to mention to you. And uh, it's got to do with uh, the number of animals. So, chickens, uh, chickens is one thing. And uh, I think th what's in the plan right now, they're, they're going up as high as 20, right? Uh, we have people in our community who uh, look after their own food source, and, uh, and uh, they have broilers. Now, there's a difference between a chicken and a broiler. A chicken is uh, 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 probably for eggs, and broilers are uh, for, uh, for food consumption. Um, so if you went back to anyone and said, well, you're allowed 20 broilers, uh, I don't think uh, that, you know, it wouldn't be really worth going at, we say, uh, for, for it, you know what I'm saying? So, what would happen uh, uh, when you get a broiler, he's one day old, and, uh, and uh, six weeks after that, you're actually bringing them to the slaughterhouse. Now, chicken is good, for, uh, is good for three years, laying. So, there's a difference there, and there's no mention into the town plan about that either. And then on that note, I'll sit down. Thank you. Thank you. I can repeat it if yeah so the question was um, was for the counting chickens how does that how does that affect things like breeding season you know where the number of chicks you hatch a bunch of chicks and all of a sudden you have 50 and then it goes up and down and yeah that's what so I kind of alluded to that a little bit in that you know these development regulations they're for development you know they're for buildings and uh, the use of land and they're not they don't regulate people. They don't really regulate animals. Um, so the way we've worded it, or that, is that these rules are for uh, accessory livestock buildings. You know, we're really regulating the building, um, and the idea is that the building would be designed to provide housing for twenty, and that might fluctuate sometimes. You know. Um, up and down and you know we don't I don't think we really want to get into counting animals uh, if, if we can help it sort of thing especially chicks uh, so if there's a if there's a small fluctuation there for a short time uh, you know that it is what it is so much as the building is designed for 20 and um, the key thing too is that the town does have animal regulations a separate a, sec a separate thing and so 
you know, if animals are being kept in poor conditions that are not um, appropriate, then there's a separate set of rules to, to regulate that. So if, you know, if this, if this is a building that's designed to store 20 and someone is consistently keeping 200 chickens or 50 chickens in it, you know, is that a good environment? Maybe there's another tool there that's not these development regulations where, where that's when that becomes a problem, I think. Yeah. So the the so the question was uh, trailers and buses uh, using them to house um, house animals, and how does that? It's an interesting. Right. Using using as the. It's an interesting question. I would have to think about that. I mean, typically we once a once a vehicle is kind of permanent and it's you know it's being used as a building then or as a structure then uh, I think there's a, a place for these regulate you know the same same deal that these regulations would would apply to that but I'd have to think about that a little more what kind of permitting zone does it fall in once you consider it a permanent structure and how long has it have to be there before it's considered a permanent structure doesn't okay that one's not hooked up okay yeah so the question was if uh, if a vehicle is used uh, for housing animals uh, how long does it have to be that way before it's considered a structure um, it's a good question um, I'm not sure I have an answer to that tonight and it's something I will think about uh, if you want to shoot me an uh, email, uh, I'd be happy to answer that. Yeah. Maybe we'll <laughs> save save myself from repeating them all. And yeah. <laughs> So most everybody know who I am. I've had farm animals on my property for 18 years now. Um, we have gentlemen gentleman here who's had farm animals on his property for 60 years. So if we're going on the new regulations, I'm allowed to have two sheep, for example. I already have more than two sheep. I have two sheep and a pony. So am I going to be required now to remove the pony? Or, for example, I raise two farm pigs. Um, I'm only allowed to have two animals on my property. So am I supposed to get rid of two animals to raise my two farm pigs that I'm sending to slaughter? Or what do I do in that situation? And again, like gentleman here who's been raising animals for 60 years, who has multiple, multiple goats, now he's going to be allowed to have two. And even on like a 4,000 square meter property, they're still only going to be allowed to house three animals. Like how is that going to affect like the existing people who already have their farm animals. Like is there going to be a grandfathering plan that can help us? Um, or are we going to be requested to remove our animals? Or how is that going to really play a role in this? Right? Because like I said, I've had them there now literally since 2008. There's generally been no issues. Um, we did have two complaints. Um, it was as my neighbor was selling his property, and he thought I was hindering his sale. So the two complaints came in. Um, both were the exact same complaint. The town did their investigation, found that those complaints were not actually legit complaints. It wasn't actually happening as they said it was. So, like, where would I stand or somebody else stand that have been doing this for a long time? This is a good question. Um, I think to go back uh, that, you know, these development regulations really regulate buildings in the sense that uh, if you came in and wanted to build housing for livestock, um, these are the rules that would apply. Um, the animals themselves 
I think the bigger question probably is, are they complying with the, the animal regulations? Um, and that's really where the, where the, uh, the lever would come in if it, if, if it was a concern or not. Well, our 2018 bylaws actually state that we aren't to have any farm animals on our properties. But our development, development plan prior to states the amount of farm animals we can have on our property. But again, then the bylaw came out in 2018 saying that we couldn't have any of these farm animals. Um, again, lots of us have had them. There has been no issues. No one has come to me and said, now get rid of that. Yeah. Um, so again, like if we are going by our current bylaw, then none of us can have farm animals because it actually states there's no um, swine, goats, horses, sheep to be on anybody's land. And literally that's from our 2018 bylaw. And I have done all the research on our prior by our prior development plan, that development plan states how many pound actually per animal is allowed to be on your property. So again, the bylaw is saying no farm animals. The d previous development plan says farm animals. Now the new one says farm animals, but you're only allowed two on your property. And if you have like 4,000 square meters, you're allowed to have three. And again, like I raise two farm pigs per year so like that's my two farm animals so am i supposed to get rid of my 10 year old pony so i can bring in my farm pig that i'm going to slaughter in six months from now again i've have a i actually have a pet pig i've had her on my property for nine years she's not for slaughter she's actually my pet again where do we define to as well what's your pet and what's your supper right like in all seriousness like Raising turkeys. I raise turkeys every year. So I might have two turkeys. They lay out 20 eggs. She hatches her 20 turkeys. At the end of the year, I send those 20 turkeys to slaughter. There's my turkeys for the winter. Yeah. But again, now I have 22 birds running around my property. But again, that's going to change with like the season. Like most people in the winter, like we don't keep an excessive amount of farm animals due to the fact it's really hard, <laughs> right? I'll be the first one to tell you, like, it's hard maintaining everybody in the wintertime much more than it is in the summertime. So, again, that's why we raise our broilers in the summertime. And, again, broilers are completely different because you got them for six weeks. Turkeys, you have them for 14 weeks. So, again, where does it play in for people who are providing food for themselves, people who have pets, or like just general because now you're saying pretty much that any person can go get two goats and let them live on their property right like but me who've had my farm animals all these years now have to remove them because I'm over my limit so that's what I'm looking for I'm looking for some type of grandfathering plan that can help us like the existing people who've had them for all these years to be able to continue doing what we're doing like I don't think I have bought meat in eight years because we always owned it half a cow. We raise our own farm animals, we raise our own pigs, we raise our own turkeys, chickens, rabbits, um, pheasants, quail. We have raised a little bit of everything and I literally have not had to buy a meat source in eight years in a grocery store, right? And it started out smaller, of course, but as the food demand becomes more expensive, of course we're going to take the easier route, well, it's, I can't say easier because there's nothing easy <laughs> about it, um, but we are going to take the route where we try to save ourselves money. And like I said, like raising the two pigs, again, like that's going to be something that I'll have to take in consideration because am I going to have to slaughter my pet sheep because like my sheep, I take her for walks on a leash. I tell everybody she's a llama doodle, and they believe me. But like she's my pet. She's never going to leave my property. Um, but she has lambs, like I will breed her. She'll have her two lambs. Her two lambs will go to slaughter. So now I'm up to three sheep on my property, right? So like where is the happy medium gonna come in where we can continue doing what we do and not have to worry about someone showing up on our property tomorrow or the next day saying, no, get rid of that. Like you're over the amount of animals. Like we, we do have to feed ourselves too. Like I don't eat 20 turkeys. But like my grandmother, my mother, my family members, like we pass it out. And like I said, I've been doing this literally now for 
18 years, and I actually went, got all my permitting, which actually states from the town of Carbonara for my animal fencing and structures back in 2020. And then in 2022, I got a letter that told me I couldn't have them. So where is the happy medium? Like, what are we going to do to protect people like myself? Because there isn't a lot of us in Carbonara. There's maybe like, I don't know, a dozen that have been raising farm animals. But like, that's what There's I'm- many more that you're not aware of. That we're not aware of, yeah, because a lot of people keep it secret and don't want to come forward because they're afraid of the backlash that's gonna happen, that well now they found out we have fire metal, so now the town's coming after us, right? And again, that shouldn't be a person who's trying to provide for themselves. They shouldn't have the fear that the town is coming after them because they got 20 chickens in their backyard, and now they got 30 because we're gonna send 10 to slaughter, right? Like it shouldn't be a fear of any community member to be in fear that the town is coming after them because they're trying to provide for themselves. Um, but again, like my main goal is to have something for the existing people that we can continue to do what we are doing. But again, like three animals on a 4,000 square foot lot, it's not very many. <laughs> like it's like two, and again, you're calling like a large animal a horse. I have a pony. My pony is actually smaller than my sheep. So is she considered a small animal, right? Like, if, well, I'm coming tomorrow anyway to have a talk yeah, with you. Yeah. But like, I did want to make the point of like, what is going to happen to, because I know some people aren't going to be here tomorrow. Yeah. But like, I do want to ask like, are, is there anything in place that we can be grandfathered in or has there been a discussion or anything along those lines that can help us? Or is that just something that is not possible? <laughs> so point taken, first of all. Um, I think again the challenge with these documents are going to be that at the end of the day the development regulations don't really regulate animals per se. Um, so I'm not sure that there's going to be a clear direction out of this document in terms of um, existing animals uh, and and how they, how they would be addressed. Um, one of the things that is a, so, you know, this these documents talk about housing for up to 20 chickens. The current animal bylaw actually the limits 10 um, in that bylaw. So there's a conflict there, and that was a discussion point at council when I presented these documents uh, to council the drafts. Um, so that, I think, is something around that discussion table, you know, uh, we wanted to float out that number as, do we need to go back out, does the town need to go back and look at the numbers in the animal bar, for example? Um, so I think that uh, at least uh, circling around that conversation uh, as part of this process, but it's a bigger conversation than ju just this process. Um, I do want to clarify too that the rules have not changed for um, Farms, in this, you know, there are. I know there are farms on the outskirts, uh, that full-on barns and all that kind of stuff. That hasn't changed if you're in the rural zone. Um, but yeah, the, the your instance and the other the other instances in town where there are existing animals, um, it's a challenging it's a challenging thing to regulate and to regulate cleanly. And uh, I think for tonight, heard your point really well. Uh, I think that's a discussion that we'll keep having with council uh, through this process. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to know, um, my son and I recently bought 14 acres of land here in Carbonier with the idea of going farming, where most of my son was. The, farm, the land that we bought was in the past all farmland. It is, all markers are still there, everything. We bought the land, and since we bought the land, we found out that the land has gone from farmland into conservation land. So we went back to the people that sold to us and that had been paying taxes on for, I have no idea how long. They had never got any notification whatsoever that their land had been changed over from farmland to conservation land. One third of my son's land is still in hay production every year. 
one third of mine is the two adjacent pieces of land that we bought. Uh, and one third of mine is in rural residential. All the land around us is either rural residential or rural or medium de rural medium density. So what is the procedure if I got to go through or we got to go through to convert this land back to what it was always from conservation back into rural res rural residential again. We want he wants to set up a farm. There's fourteen acres of farmland that we want to use. Yeah, so now's a really good time to look at those kinds of things. I mean at any time for anybody you can come into council and request rezonings and there's a process for all of that and it takes time and everything. Uh, as part of this plan review, we can look at those rezonings as part of the bigger package. We've been in contact with the Department of Agriculture on all in Newfoundland on all levels. Yeah. We've sent soil samples off. They've come back. They give us recommendations. Even one recommendation for our land is on the south facing. They've even recommended, recommended that we use it for an apple orchard or a portion of for apple orchard. The land, the soil samples that we got back, all the land hadn't been used in at least 50 years. They found no additives to the soil, no pesticides, no herbicides, no nothing. And this land can be according, and even the water supply on this land, we don't even need town water. We have our own water supply. That the town, this land can be, every prop, everything that's produced from that, as long as we don't put anything on it, can be claimed as organic. So all we're wanting for is to go farming. That's all we want to do. Yes. And we're not talking animals. We're talking straight up farming. Yeah. So um, I would say either come in tomorrow or drop off written submission with the town or email us a written submission, um, you know, identifying if you have surveys or deeds. Or whatever, I got everything. Whatever you need to specifically tell us where the land is yes, and sir. what it is. Well, I know what you want to do, but. I got everything you need. Remind me anyway so that I don't. So what time do you want to see me tomorrow? I'm up at I'm up at five. I'm, I'm here from nine till four. Well, I'm up at five. You want to go for coffee? So yeah, I'll be I'll be in the community room from nine till four tomorrow uh, with a quick break for lunch. So oh, I'll be there before lunch. All right, sounds good. I'll see you before lunch for sure. I'll be there at nine. Sounds Thank you, good. sir. All right. So uh, thanks for coming. Uh, public engagement is a very important part, as you mentioned earlier. It's the it's the blueprint for the growth and development of the town over the next 10 years. Um, I had a quick question. I read through the municipal plan draft, the development regulations. Um, I own a short-term rental property here in the Heritage Zone. Uh, I just want some clarification around what that means. I read some language there with respect to home occupation. Basically, that um, my understanding and my interpretation of the documents uh, was that um, the owner of the, the property would have to live on site in order to use it as a short-term rental. So I'm just looking for clarification on that language. So uh, if you're in the heritage area zone, so yeah, for a home occupation, the owner of the uh, property would have to live on site because, uh, you know, it's a home. Or sorry, the owner of the business would have to live on site. It doesn't, you don't have to own the property. You could be a renter and have a home occupation if that's what your uh, person you're renting from allowed. But the, the, run, the owner of the business has to live on site. But if you're in the heritage area zone, uh, accommodations are permitted use as a separately. So you'd be fine under, under the, under as an accommodations use, whether or not you live there. Perfect. Um, is that is that clear in the regulations? Maybe I wasn't interpreting it correctly. Maybe something as a if you're not clear on it, and I have to explain it to you, maybe it's something we need to. Uh, yeah, if you, you can just clarify the language <laughs> yeah. a little bit, that'd be uh, that'd be great. Yep. I also have a secondary question. Yeah. Um, just curious about the um, you know you, you talk about the challenges with housing supply. Um, just curious the stance, or if there are any um, consideration for um, minimum type of square footage for home, like. Um, as we enter this era of housing challenges, uh, are there any consideration for, say, mini home, tawny home, um, anything like that? Because I know traditionally development has been restricted, restricted to a certain minimum uh, square footage. Yeah, uh, so that was a discussion uh, with council about whether or not we should, uh, so for the context of people, uh, in the residential zones, there are a minimum uh, floor area uh, per dwelling unit. So, for example, 
Um, in the residential large lot zone, a dwelling unit has to be at least 110 square meters, which is like a, uh, 1,200 square feet. Um, or I'm trying to look here. Uh, I think it's like in the 80s in the other zones. Uh, residential medium, minimum floor area at 65 uh, square meters. So, yeah, there is a minimum size on a dwelling currently in the residential zones, um, and that was a you know a discussion with council of whether or not uh, that should remain or um, have a window for smaller housing options. Um, so there is, there's currently still that minimum in the uh, drafts, but if that's something that you would like to see changed, certainly uh, submit that, and that's a discussion we can we can have with council. Perfect. Thank you very much. John Bapp. Uh, just on uh, following up on that, that inquiry, um, what is the criteria for determining the minimum size of square footage, for instance, in the medium density zone? Why 65 versus 80 versus 50? Can you, is, there, is there a guidelines that you went by, or was it just something esoteric or uh, determinative elsewhere? Or I think that's my question. Thank you. If you could give us some light on that, it would be great. Uh, so they're in the current regulations, and they've been carried forward. Uh, to be honest, I don't know what the history of those would be other than having a minimum, I think. Oh. Yeah. Like in a good many cases, uh, there was pre-existing grandfathered usage, just, and, and in some cases they have been changed for various reasons. But you know, evidently there are, there are areas uh, within the town and housing within the town where houses have been, for instance, less than 65 square meters. So, uh, you know, in terms of grandfathering those in, is there a window or any mechanism for, for continuation of those things? And, you know, in some cases, proof is a problem. But, you know, ultimately, on a go-forward basis, in this climate particularly, what's the criteria? chair development so anything that pre-exists with development with those housing they they continue to pre-exist I mean you can't ask people to build a piece onto their house if their house is smaller than the regulations but the, the regulations for house sizes are also bound by you have to have a minimum street like you have to have so much street frontage in order to build a house so like sometimes there's a ripple effect when you set housing sizes if you don't have enough street frontage and you're not on a service street etc then that impacts that but we did like with the high density um one that we rezoned that allows for like a higher level number of houses and um you know or apartments or seniors apartments or you know whatever you know whoever wants to put whatever there but um i mean like we didn't get I don't think we got a whole lot of feedback on the mini homes and it, we, we struggled with it when we met with you Ian yep. because like say for example in a low density zone like such in on Forest Road like to put a mini home in the middle of you know certain streets it's just not aesthetically it doesn't suit different neighborhoods so like mini homes would have to suit you know, specific neighborhoods and sections of the town in order, you know, for, you know, for people not to complain about the fact that there's many homes going there. So the comment there was that uh, in those situations where there isn't enough frontage for a regular home, uh, would it not make sense then wouldn't it be perfect for a, a mini home or a tiny home? Yeah. There, there's a minimum, like those would be different rules then that would have to be amended. And then like you're also looking at like driveway access, like all those kinds of things. So like, you know, 
Um, I, I, I would have to follow up like with Ian and Cynthia on that question and, and that Ian, the Ian, Ian that is our public County, works County guy County. Yeah. and the consultant Ian. But I mean, like there, there has to be a minimum, you know, like you, there's street reservations, there's setbacks, like, you know, we're just coming out of huge snowstorms, and I mean, the amount of complaints that we got about snow, and snow on people's properties, and damage to garbage box, and fences, and all the rest of it, I mean, you have to have a setback from the road, so like, you know, that's why, you know, these standards are in place to try to make it um, you know, so that residents' property is respected and town equipment is okay and, you know, we've got the space, you know, to do what, you know, we can kind of thing. So I hope that answers it. Yeah, I, I think for the for the purpose of the housing discussion, you know, there's the standards for lots and all those things and, and part of that, as Danielle says, is to, is to, you know, make sure that there's room for snow clearing and all that sort of stuff. I, when it comes to the, the minimum housing size, I think that's a... a an interesting question for you as the community is, is, is having a minimum important or, n or, or not? Uh, and we certainly um, welcome feedback on that as, as, as part of this engagement because that's a discussion we can have with council uh, depending on what we hear. If I may, that really hasn't answered my question. 50 versus 65 versus 80, why in particular zones? That's my question. And, and uh, historically, there are, there are usages, uh, no doubt, that, that are existing. But on a go-forward basis, even, why? I'm aside now from, from, from lot sizes and frontages and accessibility, all that, in terms of the actual living area, why those differences? Yeah. Uh, in, unless anyone, I, I don't have a, a history of why those specific numbers, I think. Uh, uh, and I mean, our current plan is 20 years old. So I wasn't here 20 years ago. But I do know when we were looking at the accessory buildings, like ours is Peter's on development with me. And, you know, we get a lot of complaints about the 7% because people want to have a garage and they want to have a shed and they want to have a greenhouse and, you know, all these things. So what the office did was they surveyed all the municipalities, St. John's, Gander, Clarenville, Grand Falls, Deer Lake, Pasadena, and they sent an email and saying, these are the percentages that all these communities are using for their accessory lot size. And um, 10 came at the high, and there was some lower than our current seven. So we couldn't come up with a like, why wouldn't we go 10? You know what I mean? If, like, the city of St. John's was using 10, then the 10 should work for the town of Carbonier. So I, I, I can't say for certainty, but I would imagine that those lot sizes originally came from either consult consultation with whoever did our previous plan or municipal affairs or land use and environment or something like that. But, like... I don't think they just said randomly, like, okay, this is low density and this is medium density. And some of it also probably could have been grandfathered in according to the housing that was here at the existing time. Like if you looked at some of our older streets like Crocker's Cove, um, White's Road, London Road, you know what I mean? Some of the streets that have been here for a long time, they may have looked at those lot sizes and went from there. And then um, when they developed new subdivisions, they might have you know, adjusted the sizes accordingly. I don't know, that's not much of a, an answer, but I will, I will get that answer for you. It, it doesn't really answer the question, but yeah. just me. It, yeah. it just, okay. so, yeah. it, so again, we're not dealing with lot sizes, yeah. Mr. Commissioner, Mr. Watson. No. We're talking about floor space and areas. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, just, I'm just, that's all. I just want the questions. I, I don't want you to go away thinking tonight that that answer, no, no. that that's been answered, because it has not been. Well, okay. I think, I think what, Daniel was getting at there was, uh, you know, th that does happen in these documents where there are numbers that someone, you know, they may not have pulled it out of there. There may have been a reason 30 years ago that came up and then municipalities copy from each other and you will see those same numbers. And but, but, but again, th those answers, like in terms of, of uh, not even probably in the previous regulations, it may have been usages before the regulations, yeah. long before. Okay. okay, thank you.
Um, Well, we've got everyone here a good time to, uh, on the development committee, we spend a lot of time arguing over fences. The plow's not knocking them down, they're too high. Uh, I'd just like to get the, we're we're planning a small increase in the the size of side fences, I think from six feet to six foot seven. But that's, again, that's just a number we kind of, I don't know how we arrive at that number, really. It was, you know, it was suggested. Now we we have people who value their privacy. They like to have fire pits and hot tubs and and uh, have a bit of privacy while they use the while they use their backyard. Uh, we've had several people uh, in the community who have uh, fences that are much higher than our current regulations, and I would just like to some feedback from the audience here how they feel about a six foot fence or as opposed to an eight foot fence you know does it really it doesn't bother me my neighbors we have a row of trees between us that are probably 30 or 40 feet high so we got no worries about uh privacy but uh i'd just like to get some feedback on how the audience feels about changing the height of fences possibly to even eight feet and piece of board Uh, oh, go ahead. This, this is not specific defenses or setbacks or anything. It's just as development committee, um, we just want clear rules and regulations in black and white that we follow. So what we do for you, we do for you, we do for you and you and you and you and you. Because when you have regulations and they're there and they're clear in black and white, you know what I mean? Like it makes it easier. So then no one is... You know, I know him, so well, he's gonna. I'm gonna let him have this, and I know you, so you can have this. It keeps this fair for everyone, and there's always exceptions. Like always, always. Like just when you think, oh, we got this all right. Like there will always be a little exception to the rule because there's some little tiny gray area. But I mean, like at development, I mean, what we do every we we meet two Thursdays a month. And if you meet the rule, if you pass in a, an application and you meet all the criteria, we don't even, like, we don't even talk about it. Sometimes there's permit, there's lots of times there's permits issued here and we never know, you know, the ins and outs of it until we get to the council meeting and we approve permit listing this through this because they meet all the regulations but when you don't meet the regulations or you don't get your permit that's when it ends up at development and basically it's a problem solving process is there a way that we can problem solve this situation so that they can get what they're applying for can we find you know little cracks in our own rules or the provincial rules or whatever you know so that you know we can give people what they want And unfortunately, sometimes there's not. Like, our hands are bound. And we are legally bound. The the decisions of council are legal on all council. So if something did happen, like, I'm setting myself up for legal action where I approve something that is illegal. And, you know, unfortunately, like, that's, you know, I'm not willing, you know, I, I, I like rules and regulations, as do, you know. So that that's that's why we initiated this whole development plan review. Not only because it was 
20 years old and needed to be done, but we were just encountering so many, you know, issues. And there are some things we can't change. Like you can't have things in front of your house. You can't have a fence in the road reservation because those are rules that, you know, some of them are provincial rules and they, they supersede anything that we, we decide here. But this is what we wanted to do. We wanted, you know, to get feedback from people about, you know, what can we do better? What has changed since the last plan? You know, like, you know, a lot of things have changed. The setting of the town has changed. The amenities of the town has changed. The map of the town has changed. We wanted to improve. Yep. Just to add, I'm standing next to the mic. Oh, yes. <laughs> kids are your niece and nephew and now they're in a bag it says do not put bag on your head <laughs> yeah. well that wasn't always on those bags but at some point someone put the bag on their head and now it's written there in large black print <laughs> so with regulations oftentimes when you look at like historical municipal plan <coughs> regulations they're probably five pages long that's about it but now like something happens an issue happens like fences have been a big issue for us um, but like some of the stuff comes into play when there's been issues that continue being raised to the municipality, and not just our municipality, across the province. Yeah. So just to put it in context, like some of these numbers, like the last municipal plan was done by a lady who was very thorough with her job. She probably checked with other municipalities the, with areas in the same geographical area that we have, the same kind of density that we have, and came upon that number at that point. Um, the, he, the numbers weren't taken out of the air or just from a from a fishbowl but they the importance about this and it's great to see everyone here tonight mm -hmm. because we are doing this review and the feedback from everyone is so important so if, if you were too shy to speak up tonight make sure you get in touch with Ian and we will be posting things and it will be sent out again tomorrow and he's here until four o'clock tomorrow so yeah. and even if and even if you did speak tonight, uh, I did take notes. Uh, and we have the recording, but it's super helpful if you go use the online form or email. Just that way, you know we have a record of it. It will all be in, like, we will have a table, and we will methodically go through all the comments and make sure they uh, get get at least discussed uh, with council at the at the next uh, go around. So. Um, uh, carbonierplan.ca um, go there for the form for the email address write something give something in writing to the town or come talk to me uh, tomorrow and uh, as I mentioned this round of engagement uh, is formally open till the 21st of April um, that's the easiest time for us to make changes so super helpful if you can get comments in before then um, and then again, as I mentioned, there will be a public hearing at a later date once the province has reviewed the documents and council enters the formal adoption process. But it's certainly easier to change things now than it is to change things at that point. So don't wait until eight months from now to have, have your feedback. Mr. Watson, uh, you're accompanied by whom tonight? Who, who, was at, uh, who was at the rear just on that mic there that time? I didn't get your name. I work with the town. Okay. Uh, who? Yeah. Okay. Thank you all for coming out on a rainy night, and uh, I'm sure I'll see some of you tomorrow. Thank you, guys.